So I'm going to talk about a project that we have um, going on at the moment at Glasgow. Um, the project is called um, Viajero, which if you speak Spanish is um, Traveller. And the aim of the project is to radically improve passenger journeys by facilitating the use of immersive virtual augmented reality to support entertainment, work and collaboration on the move. So our, our niche is trying to, to think about how you might be able to use uh, XR um, when you're on a bus, on the train, in a car, um, when you're traveling. There's not actually been very much work on that. Um, and there's some interesting things it brings up, which I'll talk about. So back in the 1950s, you know, when they thought about the future, the future looked a bit like that. We'll be speeding towards this futuristic city uh, with the front seats turned around to make a nice social space. We'll be sipping a cocktail or something on the TV. Um, um, so that's what travel of the future was like. Well, what is travel really like today? Maybe it's a bit more like this. So my kids are a bit older now, but there was plenty of times when they were screaming in the back and I would rather have escaped to uh, be in a, a pleasant virtual world doing something else. So that's the kind of thing we're thinking about. Um, how can we support passengers to be able to do different things whilst they're traveling? You know, maybe you want to escape the reality of your uh, current environment. Uh, if you're in a, you know, a, an economy plane seat in that, the horrible seat in the middle row of in the five and you're stuck in the middle and you've got a 10 hour flight. Maybe there's other places you would like to be. And if you think about commuting, perhaps, you know, your journeys are often repetitive and wasted time. Um, you're sitting on the bus doing the same thing in the morning and the evening every day. If you think about autonomous cars, perhaps you know, they might make, make that even worse. There's talk of more journeys will happen when people have autonomous cars. So we'll use, we'll use cars more often. Um, so we could, could make more time trapped in small metal boxes. And oftentimes in those situations, yeah, you have limited access to technology. So you know, maybe you have your phone or in a plane, you might have a small thing on the seat back. Maybe you have your laptop with you, but it's nothing like being in the cinema um, uh, or even being in your office where you might have multiple screens. So the things we're focusing on are entertainment, productivity and collaboration. So how can, you, how can you be entertained? How can you work? How can you collaborate? Be with your friends and family or colleagues whilst you're uh, watch you're on the move and in transit. And then I'll mention four research challenges which cut across all of those. The first one being, well, of course, you're trapped in a small space. You, know, you might be able to see that you're in outer space or underwater, but you're still trapped physically in a small space. There's interesting issues about sensing uh, and, of course, social acceptability because you're there using XR in a public place. Uh, and underlying all of that, there's motion sickness, if you're not careful, using VR and AR technology when you're on the move can cause motion sickness. So I'm gonna give a, a kind of brief overview of all of this, uh, this kind of area. There's lots more I can talk about. If anyone's interested, we can, we can talk more detail. This is a kind of overview of some of the work that's going on. If you've got any questions as you're going along, stick up your hands and ask or, or save them till the end. So what can we do in XR? Let's think a bit about um, entertainment to start off with. So instead of perhaps um, looking at my phone if I'm in the back of a car, I'd prefer to be in IMAX cinema. I want a huge screen. Well, why not? If it's, if it's a VR headset, it's just pixels. I can have as many uh, pixels as I like and have whatever size screen I want. Maybe I want to play an immersive game uh, in that middle seat of the five uh, in an economy, uh, in economy flight. Just pixels, I can do whatever I like with those pixels. So I could enable these kind of experiences. So here's a couple of examples. So this one, first of all, is not um, in a vehicle. What you can see uh, on the bottom corner there is Mark in one room. You'll see uh, Fiona in another room. So you can see Mark's wearing a headset um, with a depth camera. We're cutting him out of his scene um, and we're cutting Fiona out of her scene and pasting them in. It's a little bit hard to see, but that is uh, a VR cinema, you can see the you can see the movie screen and you can almost, you can almost see some seats in there. With a better contrast, you can see the seats. So they're, they're having a, a collaborative movie watching experience uh, from different locations. So for a, Mark could be in the car, Fiona could be uh, at home or in a different vehicle, but they can share the same experience. Here's another one. So this is um, uh, driving around the street in front of our department. Um, so here's a space shooting game going on. 
Uh, and in this case, the motion of the vehicle controls the motion of your spaceship uh, as you're flying around. So there's Mark shooting at aliens uh, as, he's as he's been driven around. So it allows him to escape being in the vehicle, and now he can be in outer space. You saw a little sensing platform on the, on the um, uh, dashboard of the car. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Some of you, you can't have fun all the time. Sometimes you've got to work. Um, well, you know, maybe in my office, I've got two nice 4K monitors. I don't work on my phone if I don't have to. Well, could I have those two 4K monitors when I'm, when I'm on the train commuting into work? They're only pixels. I can have as many as I like. So here's an example of um, a little project we did looking at how you might use multiple displays in VR. Now, again, this one isn't, this one isn't in motion, but it could be. Again, you can see Mark in the bottom corner there. This time we've got a big set of screens all around. In this case, we've got a keyboard. So this project was with Logitech. Um, this was a prototype. They now have a product of a keyboard that can be tracked in VR, closely registered what, what you can see. So you can just about touch type on it um, so that then you can bring a high bandwidth input device uh, into VR. Because in, in all other ways, input in VR is terrible. Um, but using the keyboard like that, which you could do if you were on a train or something like that, um, makes that problem better. Interesting thing about this one is, just because you can make screens of any size all around you, doesn't mean that you should. Because the problem is, looking at screens behind you is really not very nice. So we were looking here at kind of counter-rotating the screens and things like that to make it ergonomically nicer for you. So there are physical constraints. The human doesn't change their physical constraints. So we need to think about how to manage that. Here's an example of that then on the move. Again, driving around in front of our department. So this time you can see a Word document in front. Um, but this time, the Word document is stabilized in front of you. So it's no use if you have a Word document in front of you. And as the car turns, the Word document is over here. And that's not useful to anybody. Or it would be the same for a movie, a movie screen or a game. So here we're stabilizing the view. Um, the interesting issue about stabilizing the view is then that can lead to motion sickness. Typically, motion sickness occurs when your eyes are you know, reading a book or something fixed in front of you, but your vestibular system is detecting motion. You don't get that when you're flying the spaceship through space because the spaceship uh, is turning at the same way, in the same way that you're turning. In this case, that's not happening. Um, so this causes other issues, which we'll, we'll come to later on. Um, and like I said, we're also thinking about collaboration. So um, uh, the nice example of the VR thing we, I saw earlier on was two people collaborating in the museum and being together. But many uh, situations, you know, you're in VR on your own. We don't want to do that. Or maybe when you're traveling, you're on your own. We want to be able to bring people in to, to be able to collaborate together and be together. So that might be working remotely with colleagues or being with friends and family. So here's an example of one. In this case, actually, Katrina and I are in the car together. But of course, we could be in different places. Um, but we're, we're in the same virtual environment. The building you can see in the background is Glasgow Central Station. Um, we're doing a virtual bus tour. So as we start moving, we'll go past the central station. And we augmented the side of the station with information about, about things that go on in there, which you'll see in a minute. But here, we're sharing the scene together. So we're having a collaborative experience. You can see some stuff on the side of the building. version of the space shooting game where we're playing together. Um, so uh, we, can, we can do different kinds of tasks. And of course, she could be in one car, I could be in another car, and we could be playing together. So that's the kind of, you know, that's the vision of what you might do. There are a few challenges that get in the way of that and making that uh, work. Let's think about some interaction challenges to start off with. Um, so typically, Interaction in VR, room scale VR, is you moving around, uh, attacking things, beat sabering things. Um, and of course, that's not going to work very well if you're in that economy plane seat uh, in the middle of the five, because the people next to you are not going to be very happy if you start sword fighting with them. So you know, can you map smaller movements into a larger VR space? Um, how can you make kind of efficient, high throughput interactions when you're, when you're trapped in that small seat? That's a really challenging problem. Um, um, but you do have some potential things on your side. 
because there are things in the physical environment that you might be able to use because they're quite close to you. So, for example, if you thought about it, um, you have got that seat in front of you. The only advantage you have over those people in business class is that you can reach the seat in front of you. There's this, the seat's so far away, you can't even see it, probably. But for in economy, you can use that. So then you've got a haptic surface in front of you that you could use. So we were, for example, looking at this to use it as a passive haptic surface. So if you represent a virtual object in line with the seat in front of you and you touch on that, well, it feels like a solid object because you're actually touching the seat back. So this idea of passive haptics can work quite well when you've got these surfaces close by. Of course, you might use the tray table because that's conveniently located as well. You might use the, the armrest. Um, so you can use these things around you to your advantage. In some ways, they're a disadvantage because they're trapping you in. But in other ways, they may be useful to you. So we, um, we did an experiment where we looked at how we might be able to use these things. So we got ourselves two rows of plane seats. Uh, so we have uh, the, the, the makings of a private jet. I'm slowly building it up uh, piece by piece. So I've got two seats, two rows of seats to start off with. Um, uh, so you can see um, uh, the different conditions in this experiment where we had one tray table folded down, so a horizontal surface, with the green one as a vertical surface. And actually, the purple one, which you can't see so much, is an inclined surface, because actually the back of the seat further down um, goes away from you. So we created a Fitz Law task, if you're familiar with that. It's a, a kind of motor control task beloved by us HCI people uh, to measure human performance. So what you had to do is you had an object here. You had to move to the passive haptic surface, the seat back, touch on that, and then drag. Move back, touch, drag. So it's a variation of the ISO standard um, Fitz Law task. And the great thing about that is it allows you to measure pointing and, and dragging performance. So we compared in-air interaction. So you had to do that just by seeing the, um, the, the, the blue square and touching on the targets versus vertical, inclined, and horizontal. Um, maybe it's no surprise, but the passive haptics significantly improved the performance. Of course, because you're, you're dragging and touching on a solid surface compared to, compared to doing it in midair. So those people in business class who can't reach a seat in front, they're a disadvantage to, to the rest of us. Uh, so reduced time taken, reduced error rates. Um, also things like improved agency, self-location. So people felt more like they were in control, they were in the scene because they're touching against something solid. So it gave them other benefits um, uh, as well. Performance on the tray table was the best. So the horizontal tray table was the best. The interesting problem there was that looking down at that tray table, because we set the seats, we set the seats to uh, Ryanair level, so not a lot of space. So you're really looking down quite a lot like that. And so we found that people started to get sore necks. So that made it uncomfortable. So performance was good in the horizontal, but uh, neck issues made it painful. So then what we decided to do is this idea of perceptual retargeting. So uh, here you were no longer touching where you're looking. So the task was the same, but for example, in the vertical condition, you can see an A and B there. In the vertical condition, in B, we actually move the virtual representation of your hand up, because this, so everything is moved up. So instead of touching uh, here, you look like you're touching here. That means you then don't have to look down so far. Um, the same for the, um, for the horizontal one in C versus D. So we looked at the horizontal one here, and then we looked at different amounts of um, rotation um, um, in front of you. So that uh, the more you rotate it, the less you have to look down. Um, and for small amounts of, of, um, of those manipulations, actually you don't really notice so if you do remapping, for example, for the horizontal one, uh, if you did it 45, 60 degrees, it was still perfectly fine to control and interact in that space, but then the neck issues go away because you're not looking down anymore, you're looking up a bit more. When you start to go to, say, 90 degrees, and the screen is here, but you're touching here, that just uh, totally breaks your brain and you can't control it any longer. Now, you might say, but I do that with a mouse all the time. But the problem is uh, moving in 3D space. 
It's not the actual moving on the 2D surface, it's the 3D part of the task because you have to move, that's impossible, you have to move like this and it goes like that. So even talking about it is too hard to, to describe. So uh, you have to be careful how much um, of the retargeting you do, but a small amount of retargeting worked really well, resolved the neck issues, kept input performance high, and you could use that horizontal tray table in, in an effective way. So it shows you, you can think kind of creative, creatively how you can use those things around you, um, but then you might have to do all the manipulations to make them effective. Um, let's think a few, a few sensing challenges. There's lots and lots of sensing challenges. I'm not going to talk about them all. Particular ones to do with moving. Um, a tricky problem is maintaining, well, is, is trying to extract what is vehicle movement versus what is head movement. So a typical headset right now does inside-out tracking, so it has some cameras on it, and it has an IMU, um, and because I'm, I'm in, in the space and I'm looking and moving around, all, all the movement is due to me. And the cameras and the IMU all line up nicely, and you know, if you use a, a Quest 2 or something like that, the tracking is pretty good. If you put them in a car or any kind of moving vehicle, well, when the vehicle turns, is that head motion? Is that me doing that, or is it the car doing that? There's, the heads, headset can't know. Um, and what tends to happen is it gets very confused because the cameras might say, yep, not moving, that's all good. Um, but the IMU says, ah, movement, movement. So um, then um, uh, the tracking goes crazy. For example, if you try and use a Quest 2 in the car, uh, it's impossible, it just drifts like mad. Most headsets are, are terrible because they're not designed for that kind of um, um, uh, movement. They're designed for all the movement being around the user, not, not in the environment. So we had to build a, we had to build a platform um, to, to solve this kind of problem. As you can see on the bottom there, I'll just show you a little video of it actually. Um, so we built a, a little sensing platform, it's just off the shelf components with Arduinos and things like that. It's nothing su fa super fancy, but it needed to be low latency because latency is the, the source of a lot of motion sickness. Um, so we put that in the car, that detects the car motion from accelerometers and gyros. We get data from the car itself to give us some, some car data. And that means then we can know, well, what's car movement versus what's head movement? So we can, we can separate those two things. That allows us to have a stabilized view, for example, as I showed before. And we built a little Unity plugin. It means that you can, then, um, you can then do this in Unity very easily. There we are. You can see it in action. Um, there are many other kinds of sensing issues that come up. Um, you know, key, key ones in the scenario I was talking about with the tray table is how do you detect con contact between the finger and the tray table when you've got the cameras pointing this way? Because, of course, the finger obscures the thing it's touching underneath. So getting, getting a contact or knowing when there's a contact between the finger and the table is very difficult. Um, and, that, and, if, and if they're not lined up well, then it starts to break the illusion that, that that surface is the surface of the thing you're touching. But that's different sensing problems, lots of sensing problems. Um, some other kinds of problems, social problems. Um, so yeah, you're going to be using the headset in a social setting, whether it's on a bus, in a car. Um, um, you might then uh, be alone, or you might be with other people you know or you don't know. So using the headset in those situations is a bit different. Interesting questions come up like, well, where should I put the display? I can have a display of, you know, what I, wherever I want, I can have these displays, but where, where should I put them? What kind of interactions are socially acceptable in these shared settings? Um, I'm not going to talk so much about that, but what kind of information do you need from the real world in order to help you um, uh, exist in the virtual world at the same time as being in the real world? So here's a, a paper that we did looking at how you might lay out screens um, um, when you're in different types of vehicles. So here we've simulated AR in VR. So in this case, you're in the back of a Tesla, there's a driver. So we asked people, we had different types of tasks, we had productivity tasks and entertainment tasks. This is a productivity, I think. So well, where would you want to put screens? If you could put them anywhere, where would you put them? In this case, you can see, they mostly just put them on the seat back in front of them. Here's, um, here's a plane where you're sat in the middle of an economy seat 
And initially he said, oh, well, of course, I'd put one here, one here, and one here. Yeah, but then if I want to use this one, I'm staring at the person next to me for like three hours as I'm working on that screen. So actually what people preferred to do was stack them vertically, because that's your space. That screen over there, that's my space. So people stack them vertically. On the train, lots of interesting issues happen on the train, especially with the one with the tray table in front of you, because if you put a screen here, that means I'm staring into your eyes as I'm working on my documents for a long period of time. So people put them on the table, which is where you put a magazine or a laptop, because that's more socially acceptable. Again, similar things with, with the subway. Uh, people tended to put them in places where it meant they didn't have to look at other people, which is quite common, you know, on, um, certainly on the uh, London Underground. They put all the adverts up here so that you never have to look at anyone in the eye. So uh, uh, people wanted those same behaviours. Sometimes people did put screens to shield themselves from others, but many times they put them out of the way so they didn't have to, to kind of have some awkward social interaction. So again, you can have screens where you like, but you're not, you're not free to put them everywhere. There are limitations. Uh, the social setup causes interesting limitations. Um, let's think a bit about input. So that was output. Where would you put the screens? Um, so here we were thinking a little bit about input. Um, is that playing? Yeah. So what you can see there, I'll just stop it for a sec. No, come back. Well, maybe we won't stop it for a second, we'll just let it go. You can see um, um, what we did was composited. Nah, come on. Composited uh, our student aroma. Why is that not playing? Here we go. We composited aroma uh, into the scene, um, into a virtual scene. And what she did was, did all kinds of different types of interactions that we could imagine you could do um, with any kind of um, device. So she's doing on the hand, she does on the seat back, she does on her leg, she does in the midair, um, all the different kinds of interactions we could think of. And then we showed people these settings. And, we, and she also does this in different settings. And we showed people this and said, well, what would you think if you saw someone doing this? Or how would you feel if you were doing that? Um, to get some ideas about the social acceptability of some of these kind of interactions. It was quite nice because this one was done during um, COVID time, so we couldn't go on any of these forms of transport, um, but we could find, a, we could find a, a, a 3D model of a train, and so that was fine. So you can see some of the different um, setups that we used. So, unsurprisingly, um, the environment has a strong effect on the social acceptability of some of those interactions. Um, in those face-to-face -face seating environments, um, um, waving controllers around in someone's face was not seen as very acceptable. Um, so those mid-air mid interactions did not, did not work so well. But in other situations, when you're on your own seat and there's nobody in front of you, m things were more acceptable. So the, 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 your location and who you were around had a big effect on the types of interactions that you were able to do. So as a designer of virtual experiences, that's rather important because you need to be able to make something that could be used in different ways depending on where people might be using it. Um, let's think a little bit about some motion sickness challenges. So interesting, interesting kind of elephant in the room underneath uh, all of these things is this, this problem of um, motion sickness. Um, so many people suffer from motion sickness, and if any of you do, one of my daughters gets, gets very motion sick, so you can't really do too much when she's in, in, the, in the back of a car. Um, about 30% of people suffer it um, commonly, and then that can go up to 70% if you, if you do even many slight provocations to, to cause it. But causes, you know, reading books, using a phone, anything where your eyes are focused on something still and your vestibular system is detecting motion. It's a little bit different to cyber sickness, which is kind of the other way around, where your eyes are seeing motion, but your vestibular system is still. But the two are very related, um, uh, and, and we're looking at kind of both of those and the combination of the two. The, the combination of the two is when you're in a vehicle, and your, your vestibular system is detecting the motions of the vehicle, but then your eyes are detecting, you know, if you're watching a car chase 
in a movie, and the car in the car in the in the car chase turns to the left at the same time as you're in a car that turns to the right, and then that's not pleasant. Uh, but if you get motion sick, then you can't really use your travel time in any uh, useful way. You, know, you have to spend your time looking out the window, trying not to throw up. Um, so what we were able to think about was, well, how can we enable people who have motion sickness now or who might get more motion sick when we start giving them XR headsets? How can we help them? So it's due to this visual vestibular mismatch. Um, immersive content can make it worse because you, know, you can't see the outside world anymore, so you don't get any visual cues of the outside world. Um, and the thing that you want most, which is this, uh, this exocentric content locked to your head so that as the car turns, your Word document or your game stays in front of you, that keeps your eyes still in relation to what's happening. So that's the thing that, that causes the most uh, motion sickness. So trying to, to solve that problem um, has been a big thing for us. As a computer scientist, I never thought so much about motion sickness. Now I, I think about it a lot. Um, so the two things you need to do, um, first of all, you need to detect when it happens, and then you need to try and mitigate it to make it go away. I'm not going to talk about lots of details, um, but I work with some, some um, neuroscientists, um, um, and we've done uh, a lot of work on detecting the onset of motion sickness. Um, so you can see the first one of these, um, this is a cyber sickness study, you can see, you can see uh, uh, one of the participants there. So in this case, we were just showing them a moving visual stimulus causing vection, um, but they were sat still. Um, the later ones, we, also, we have a chair which we control the rotation of, so then we can create rotational movements, but this one, which causes motion sickness. This, one, this picture is of cyber sickness. So we decided to look at um, what, you know, what are the physiological um, uh, things you could sense that might indicate motion sickness. So in some of the studies we did EEG, you can see the cap there, PPG, which is the, you know, the thing that you do with your, with your watch, which shines a, a light on your, on your um, veins and your skin, um, temperature sensors, also all kinds of different things to try and find out what might be a good marker for um, motion sickness. Um, so we did uh, different types of tasks, some mild stimulus, a there, it's just this little thing that floats calmly around the scene, which you just have to follow with your eyes. Then the B is a kind of tunnel task, so you're going through a kind of tunnel. The roller coaster one doesn't show such a good picture, but that's you know, the typical VR roller coaster, which causes tons of vection. Um, and it, you know, the whole point of it is to make you feel slightly, slightly sick. Uh, we can we do all those uh, different types, and we can then do them in our chair, which can do uh, controlled rotation. So we can we can simulate the rotations that you would have uh, in, a, in, a, in a, normal, a normal drive and play those back whilst you're doing that, that kind of task. Um, so I'm not the, I'm not the EEG expert, uh, but what I can tell you is brain frontoparietal connectivity decreases with the increase in sickness ratings. So you can detect an effect in the brain through EEG. The trouble is EEG is not very convenient. We don't really want to have to put on all the gel and all the electrodes every time you were to go in a car. So really what you want is a much more easy to measure physiological signal. Um, so what you can see on the graphs there, the top, the top one is the raw FMS score, so fast motion sickness rating scale. So people just rate how, how motion sick they're feeling. So that kind of gives you a gold standard. You know how motion sick they're feeling. Um, then the next one down, you've got heart rate. Yeah, not too bad, but not, not perfect. Also, if you're watching a scary movie or something, then you might think the person was becoming motion sick, but they're just getting excited. Um, fingertip temperature. Fingertip temperature actually is a really good um, indicator of motion sickness. Because when you start to get a bit sick, you might feel a bit cold and clammy. That is uh, exhibited in your skin, and particularly uh, in your fingertip temperature, which is not a terrible one to be able to measure uh, in a vehicle. Um, uh, and then, yeah, there's, that's EEG stuff. So uh, I can't tell you so much about the EEG stuff, but you can measure it through EEG. It's just that's not very convenient. Okay, so if we can, if we can measure it and know when it's happening, 
then what you could do is try and mitigate it by doing different things. So we have two solutions. The first one is uh, neurostimulation. So we might be able to do some stimulation of particular areas of your brain to be able to, to reduce it. And then visual mitigations, because we can control all the pixels you see. So let's have a look at the first one. This is, this is you also get an idea of the, um, the rotating chair. You can see the, the chair rotating there. And that's the tunnel, you can see a bit of the tunnel task there as well. Um, so that's, uh, that's not the roller coaster, that's, that's the medium, that's the medium uh, sickness inducing one. But that chair, that chair rotates around. Um, um, so uh, um, what we can do then is induce motion sickness. We can clearly induce motion sickness. We definitely know that. We had two people who actually threw up. Um, and then we can try different kinds of neurostimulation or other, or other cues. So at the moment, we're looking at transcranial alternating current. So you can use a small amount of current, um, um, which could be, for example, delivered by electrodes in the strap of the headset. Um, and that does some kind of phase locking stuff, um, which um, uh, causes significantly reduced motion sickness. So we found really strong results from, from doing the from doing the neurostimulation. The other solution we looked at was um, visual presentation. So we know what you're, we, we, know, we control all the pixels you can see. So um, that means we could use some of them to help you reduce motion sickness. So what we've got here is uh, Alex wearing a headset being driven around the streets of Glasgow. That's the streets of Glasgow. And on the left hand side, we've got a, a, a kind of motion environment, super tightly locked with low latency to, to um, uh, what he's experiencing. No motion sickness. You don't get motion sick because the visual display is very closely matched to your vestibular. So that, that works fine. So you don't, get, you don't necessarily get motion sickness by using a headset in the car. You only get it if you don't do it right. So what we did then was, um, um, you can see around the edges of the video, you can just see the, 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 um, um, the motion environment presented. The idea was it's a bit like you know, just seeing the, the world outside, outside the car windows as you're driving by, um, but you're looking at the video, um, some, I think in this case it's somewhere in Brazil, um, you're looking at a video in the middle. Uh, again, you can see Alex being, being driven around in the, uh, the streets of Glasgow near the university. So for some people that was really effective. Uh, didn't help everybody, but help, certainly helped some. Um, uh, because it just starts to give you cues about what's happening in the real world, what the orientation and the motion in the real world is. Uh, so yeah, a few results about that. The neurostimulation work is ongoing. We're just writing a paper. I was editing it this afternoon. So, so the, the, the neurostimulation works extremely well uh, in reducing motion sickness. So you can do small, it's, this is very small amounts of electrical stimulation. It has a, has a significant effect on motion sickness. For example, the number of people who dropped out of the experiment, one measure of motion sickness experiments is who says, oh, I, can't, I can't do it anymore, I've got to stop. Um, so you have far fewer of those when you had the neurostimulation than when you had um, nothing or other kind, of, other kind of methods. So the results are, were really good for that. The peripheral cues um, work, work very well for some people. We just, have, um, we just got a paper on using 3D audio cues. So you can imagine that you have 3D audio and that could be, the 3D sounds could be mapped to the real world whilst you're seeing something um, different in the visual. Less st strong effect than I'd hoped from that first experiment. But when the, when the 3D audio is coupled with an appropriate visual display, it does make a significant improvement. But on its own, it didn't help. But it did help when you combined it with good visuals. We're also thinking about how you might be able to use haptic cues. So maybe you can get some haptic feedback from the seat you're in or something like that to help cue, to help cue you. So a lot, I think lots of interesting possibilities from combining different senses there. You know, the, whole, the, whole, the whole challenge here is not to reduce the immersion in the, in the VR scene too much. Because of course, you, know, you can have a view restrictor. View restrictors are, are, are very common in games. As you're teleporting, you zoom it down to something super small and then zoom back out again. But you're kind of breaking the experience. So the whole aim of what we're trying to do is so we don't have to, to in the end, have any kind of view restrictor. We can just be, you can be fully immersed in a scene and then not have the motion sickness. The, the plan will be, you know, we can have this closed loop system where 
you can detect the onset of motion sickness, apply some mitigations, maybe it goes away, maybe it doesn't, you apply some more mitigations, so you can eventually you can keep it under control. Uh, but you can do that in real time, adding and reducing um, mitigations depending on how, how motion sick you're feeling. Uh, right, so think of a few conclusions. Um, so yeah, we spend a lot of time as, as passengers in different, in different um, situations. Um, according to the stats, those Europeans spend 12,000 kilometers a year um, traveling in different forms. So that's a lot of time, a lot of distance. Um, so so you know, some, in, I think in the UK, there's a, a large number of people who have more than two hours commuting a day. So that's a huge amount of wasted time. So could we use that for something more interesting? The whole aim of our project is to try and make sure that that's just not, that's just not wasted time and you can do something more interesting, escape those confines of the, of the, um, of the Ryanair uh, small plane seat. Um, and then you can do entertainment. You know, I can have my big screens. Uh, I can work. I can actually work effectively on my, on my uh, big monitors. Or I can be with friends and family to help me escape some of those, um, some of those uh, situations. But there are these, these kind of four big challenges underneath that that, yeah, you can look like you're in outer space, but you're still crammed into the, to the small seat. So how can, we, how can we make effective interaction in that small space? Because I can't do the big things, big gestures that I might do typically for, um, for XR-type applications. How do I deal with the social, the social issues that other people are around me? And then this thing about you know, motion sickness. How can we deal with motion sickness? Uh, and that's... You know, that's that's a big problem if you're not careful, because it means you couldn't do anything at all. And then, you know, then, you know what, what have you achieved? Yeah, and then sensing comes across all of those, because you, know, you need to sense motion sickness, you need to sense contact with surfaces. For some of the social acceptability, social acceptability work, we try to sense other people in the environment. So sensing of all these kind of things is a really big issue, again, that runs underneath them all. But if we can solve some of those problems, then, that, you know, then you can unlock the potential of travel time in future vehicles. Then we can do much more interesting things. We won't feel like we're imprisoned for 10 hours. Maybe we'll actually enjoy that, that economy flight um, uh, and have a, have a good time whilst we're doing it. All right, and with that, I will stop. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much for this inspiring uh, talk and with so many examples of what could be our future. <laughs> do, do you have any questions? We have time for a few questions. Yeah. Thank you for a very, very interesting talk. Um, I had more question about the sound cues you were talking about because I didn't really understand what they could be and well, they work, as you said, but I, I can't imagine it right away. Yeah, so, so um, what we did in, in the case of this last experiment was we used um, sounds from um, uh, the real world. So we used things that sounded like they were fixed in the real world. There's been some evidence to suggest they work. So we had a church uh, bell. Um, we had sounds of a construction site. Um, we have probably, there were two more, I can't remember off the top of my head what they were. But there was four of them, and they were from things that don't move in the real world. So it gave you some kind of concrete physical representation. So then as you move around, the sound of the church stays in the same place. So that it gives you an anchor to the real world. But on their own, it, didn't, it wasn't enough of a cue to anchor you into some kind of, in some kind of physical space. But when they were combined with the, vis the visuals, it did significantly help. But that was just the first go. I think maybe we can make it work, but the first go didn't work on its own. Thanks so much for a very <clears throat> interesting talk. My question is related to the activities uh, and the part playing um, immersive games. The man that uh, was on the car, he was driving or 
during gaming or no? Passengers. Remember, the, uh, remember this is only about passengers, okay. not about drivers. <laughs> so it could be a driver if this was a fully autonomous car yeah, and, and the then you'd given over control to the car. Yes, it is my second question. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, I want to make it clear that Mark wasn't driving. <laughs> there was another person driving. Hi, thank you for your amazing talk and the things that you're doing in your lab. I was wondering, uh, from a personal perspective, when I'm traveling, I listen to music a lot. So are you uh, in some way uh, going to incorporate listening to music or practicing even piano playing during traveling? Because, yeah, I think that is a nice direction to run some really cool ex experiments as well. Yeah, I mean, there's no, no reason like, you know, p piano playing is not a million miles away from typing on a keyboard. So if you could bring a small keyboard in front with you to, to physically play on, then that would make, that would make perfect sense. Um, if you're practicing guitar in the middle of the economy seat, <laughs> maybe ukulele or something. But um, uh, so I think some of that, of course, depends on the size of the physical space you're in. Um, but certainly audio is an interesting one, especially if the audio did work to help reduce motion sickness. You might be able to reduce your motion sickness whilst practicing or composing or something like that. Um, that, you know, that would be an aim, but we're not quite there. But I think, yeah, I think that's great. It would be good application. OK, I think uh, we can conclude here. Thank you again, Steven. And thank this you. is for you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs>